Good morning. Thanks for being with us today as we come together as one church body to worship. We want to warmly welcome anyone who might be joining us for the very first time this morning, including our online family. If this is your first time, we invite you to fill out a connection card found in the chair back in front of you. You can turn that in at our welcome desk where we also have a gift waiting just for you. And if you're tuning in online this morning, simply click on our virtual connection card and we'd love to greet you and see if we can serve you in any way. For our families, HF Kids is having their very own kids service on the lawn across the parking lot. If you have a child aged 4 to 11, we ask that you please pre-register your children online each week so we can best prepare to welcome them. Kiddos can be dropped off on the lawn starting at 9.50 a.m. each Sunday. We're also in the process of creating a safe place to have them back inside the end of this month and opening it up to our younger ages as well. As always, our parents are welcome to use our family room that is for our three and under crowd and is just out the hallway. Hey church, thank you for helping us to continue to safely worship together by wearing your mask until you find a seat. We've been putting provisions in place to ensure that the campus is safe, clean, and an environment that you feel comfortable worshiping in. And it is a big help when we each do our part. To stay connected with everything happening here at HF, we want you to be sure to check out our weekly emails and social posts. If you aren't receiving communications from us, please just stop by the welcome area to update your information. Our offering taking during this service also now looks a bit different since COVID. And instead of passing baskets, we have designated boxes on the wall in the back of the sanctuary for your tithes and missions giving. Donations can also be given online on our website at hamiltonag.church slash donate. Our goal here at HF is to help you find and follow Jesus. To listen to sermons online and be inspired in your faith, you can connect with us on our website or you can visit us on our Facebook page. And this morning, we would like to welcome to HF, Carl Nalbandian, who serves as the Chi Alpha Director to Rowan University College students. We love being able to support our local colleges through missions giving. So let's welcome him as he brings an update from campus this morning. Amen. We've been talking about the harvest. I missed you last week. We missed you. I uh, had a wedding in uh, North Jersey. That was nice. We miss the people. They're precious. We don't miss the area. Uh, we don't miss the congestion. We don't miss the traffic. I don't miss any of that. Uh, but we do miss the people. But we were up there, and so we missed you. We prayed for you. I understand Pastor Ben did a great job. And so um, because of that, I thought he did very well, too well. And so I fired him. And so he's gone now. No, I'm kidding. He and Lauren finally got a much, some of you were like, what? No, relax. Um, they're in Vermont, actually, enjoying, finally, they've got, they got married months ago, were not able to get away, so they've finally been able to get away. They're in Vermont enjoying that whole crunchy tree hugger stuff that they, those types of people enjoy, you know. But we're on, we are talking about harvest, and I was so appreciative of um, the Nalbandians who, who came, him, uh, Christine and Carl, they came to, to lead worship for us, too. Um, it takes a lot off my plate if I don't have to do, you know, keep too many plates spinning at once. And what a blessing that he was here on the very day that we're talking about the harvest. Because college campuses, yeah, the harvest. And that's part of it, a huge part of it. Such a major part of our missions. This is why we encourage you guys to be faithful in your giving, your tithing, your offering, all of that, so that we can do what it is we do. Um, I remember a time where you could, there weren't many Chi Alpha full-time Chi Alpha people in the schools. Remember Stephen Coravilla? I, I, uh, I, I, used to, I used to help Stephen Coravilla with worship when he was in uh, Montclair. Thank you. That's right. And uh, it was just such a kind of a grassroots feeling. And it was just you walked in and, and now to see what our Chi Alpha groups are doing, it's, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty intense. These are sharp kids. These are our college kids. They are malleable. They are moldable. And what I mean by that is it is an opportunity. Unfortunately, it goes both ways because you got a lot of negative that's being just poured into these, into these guys, making them think what they want them to think. There's agendas. The enemy's hard at work. So we need to be hard at work in the other direction. We are the hands and feet extended from the Lord to these college campuses through Chi Alpha. So we support multiple Chi Alphas, and we'll continue to do that till Jesus comes back, God willing. But it is about the, it is about the harvest, and um, 
so let's let's move on. Last time, uh, two weeks ago, I guess it would be, we talked about the harvest being plentiful. So let me remind you just a little bit, very quickly, about what we talked about. It was an, it's an urgent time uh, to take uh, to take heed of what we need to be doing as a Christian. We need to share our faith. We need to be vocal about what we believe. Because I'll tell you what, everyone else is vocal. And so why should we be timid or intimidated or bashful about what we know the Lord has planted in our heart? Why would we back up and allow other people to be more vocal, more vocal than us now? Does that mean we do and say what they do and say? No, it looks very different because we do it in love. And we do it under the direction and the discretion and the love of the, of the Holy Spirit that guides us and leads us, right? Arguing fixes nothing. Um, and so there's very little. Uh, so just a quick recap, as we said, uh, the, the harvest is plentiful. It's an urgent time for us to share our faith. I want to read this right now. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 verse to verse 38. We're going to read it again at the end, but I want to open with it. Matthew 9, 35 to 38. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, note, he had compassion on them. Today's harvest is plentiful. It was a couple weeks ago. Today's the harvest is precious. Jesus had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then, verse 37, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into this harvest field. Now, yes, we pray for that. But you know who else is doing the work of being sent out into the harvest field? Us. That's us. That's us. That's people praying. When somebody halfway around the world is praying that God would send laborers into the harvest field, God's using you. God's answering that prayer. You're it. Because that person praying for you in Indonesia that you'll never meet till one day you're in heaven. You'll never meet. You'll never know them. But they're praying for you. Why? Because they're praying this verse. Just like when we're praying it, somebody halfway around the world is going to a neighbor or, 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 a, or a, family, a family friend or relative, a, a co-worker, and sharing Christ with them. The harvest is plentiful. God is saying, get busy. Get busy. We also know that evangelism. Uh, we, we also know that evangelism is every Christian's mandate. Because I get this a lot, Pastor. You know, that's great. It's fine. You're a pastor. You're supposed to do that. You're supposed to be vocal and all ministerial and stuff. Every Christian's call, every Christian's mandate, is to evangelize. It is your most important task: is to witness, is to share your faith. Well, I don't really, I don't really know how to do that. Yes, you have a story. If you, if, you, if you are saved, if you know Christ, then you have a story. And all you have to do is share your story. Bingo. Instant testimonial. It's not that hard. It, does, it may take courage. But it is God's mandate. Certain things we pray for may or may not be God's will. Right? We talked about this too a couple weeks ago. Certain things we pray for may or may not be God's will. Should it be this house that I buy? Lord, should I embark on this career? Is this what you want me to do with my life? Is this, this, if, is this the man or the woman you want me? Is this the spouse you want for, for me to marry? And then you wait and you, and you pray God gives you wisdom and direction and all of that. And some of those are kind of gray areas because sometimes we're really, really certain and sometimes we're not. But we pray and God illuminates us and gives us direction and, and guidance. And sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, sometimes it's wait. But evangelism, there's no gray area. There's no gray area. It is the will of God that every one of us should share our faith. Well, how do you know that? Because it is the will of God that nobody should perish. How will they know unless we tell them? There's no question there. There's, that, it's not a gray area that, that drawing people toward the Savior is God's will. So this week we want to talk about that. The harvest is precious. Even with all of the evil that's going on in the world, God has not yet sent Jesus. He has not yet sent Jesus to rapture the church. Why? Because he wants to save as many as he can. Because they're precious to him. They're precious to him. People are precious to him. He loves souls. They're full of value. James chapter 5 verse 7. James chapter 5 verse 7. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop patiently 
waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You, you have a garden, raise your hand. If you, if you grow anything, raise your, raise your hand. Tomatoes. Or, oh. Anybody have like a good bumper crop of tomatoes this year? Really? Hey, we had a lot of tomatoes. We stole them from the neighbor's plants, but still, we had a lot of tomatoes. They were right next door. We had tomatoes. We did have our own tomatoes. We ate them throughout the... And, and uh, if you've ever grown a plant, it's really exciting. You watch the little bud, and then it turns into a little, you know, t whether it's a tomato or an eggplant or a zucchini or you know, a fig. You know, that's really exciting to watch those little things grow. It requires a whole, whole lot of slow excitement. It's a very slow excitement. <laughs> it's a very subdued excitement. It's not like, woo! -hoo! Although, when you eat the first one, that's a woohoo moment, I suppose. And uh, Andrea and I ate a bunch of tomatoes, like I said, but there's, there's one little straggler left. There's this one poor little straggler of a tomato still hanging on the plant, hanging on for dear life, and it's been green for like two months. We're like, come on, little buddy, you can do it. And it just started to turn orange last week. It's almost red. It's almost red. If that thing, fall, if that thing falls to the floor, I'm going to weep. Because we've been waiting us the, we've been waiting on this stupid little tomato to, to ripen so that we can eat the last tomato of the season, right? And uh, so you patiently wait. Now, I want you to think about the farmer who feels that way times a thousand, times 10,000. Because it's not one little tomato. It's entire harvests of what it is there. And it's party time when, when harvest time comes. And they pray for a good crop, right? Now, think how much more God is thinking about how excited he is thinking this is the harvest look look around you look at all of these souls that could come into the kingdom and grow the kingdom I'm not even gonna say grow the church because the church is you, you we're the church to grow the kingdom how excited God is. it is of the utmost important to Jesus and if it is then it ought to be of the utmost important to us Matthew chapter 18, verses 11, 14. I want you to see this. I want you to see various examples of how much Jesus loves people. Matthew chapter 8, and I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't have these saved anywhere, uh, but I'll just go through them very quickly here. Matthew chapter 18, verse 11 to 14. The good shepherd, that's Jesus, leaves the 99, you know the story, to reach that one lost sheep. And that one lost sheep is the one he doesn't want to perish because the other 99 are together. And he'll leave them to go save that one lost sheep. You know how often God compares us to sheep? You know how stupid sheep are? Do you ever wonder why God compares us to the dumbest animal alive? I'm just saying. I didn't make up. I, God, they're precious. They're a little lamb. They're sweet and succulent. And the right crust on it. It's just, ah, it's the wrong direction. Listen, that one lost sheep that God doesn't want to perish... That might be somebody living next door to you. It might be the person that you work with. It might be somebody that you go to school with. It might be somebody that knows about Jesus but doesn't know Jesus. And you could share that with them. You could share your, your testimony, your witness, your life with them. He loves people. That's why. That's why Jesus would leave the 99 to go rescue that one. John chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. Jesus shared the gospel with, his, with Nicodemus at night. You probably know this story too. Well, Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He's part of the ruling Jewish council. And Jesus shared the gospel with Nicodemus at night. Why at night? Because he didn't want to get in trouble. Nicodemus didn't want to get in trouble. And Jesus had every right to say, man, come back in the morning. But he doesn't. He doesn't. He didn't. What would you do? What would you do? It's 3 o'clock in the morning. Tell me what it means to be born again. Would you even turn on the light? Or would you pull one of those like clandestine things where you're like, who in the world could that be? Pretend we're not here. Your car's in the driveway. He knows you're here. What would you do? What would we do? Tell me what, again what it means to be born again. But Jesus loves people. So he told them all about it right there in that moment, what it meant to be born again. John chapter 4, verse 1 to 26 Jesus goes out of his way to meet the Samaritan woman at the well. Another story. I assume many of us know well. Some of us may not. Jews do not talk to Samaritans. Samaritans were half-breeds. Samaritans were Jewish people that had, in, that had intermarried with pagans. 
And the Jewish, the Jewish people looked at the Samaritans as lower class citizens. They didn't count. Jews were not supposed to talk to them. They weren't even supposed to look in their direction. But it says that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. He knew she was going to be there. He needed to go there because he wanted to teach her. Read through it on your own time what it meant to worship in spirit and in truth. That's in that scripture. That's in that passage. He knew she had gone from one man to the next. He knew that. He knew this woman had bounced from one man to the next man to the next man to the next man. The woman said to Jesus, why are you even talking to me? Because he asked her for a drink of water. And he, You're not even supposed to be talking to me. But Jesus loves people. That's what he does. This is what, this, this, all of, all these illustrations I'm sharing, the point is, it's the, it's about the harvest. Oh, I know we have, our agendas are full. We have work, we have school. It depends how old you are. If you're in classes or we have careers and we have families and we have this thing to do and that. I get it. I get how busy we are. But there is always opportunity to open your mouth and share your faith with someone. John chapter 4, verse 46 to 54. John 4, 46 to 54. Jesus meets with the nobleman, heals his son. Didn't even go there. He just spoke the words and his son was healed. And the scripture said that the moment, the moment Jesus said it, because evidently it, was, it, was, it, was, it wasn't close by. And so the nobleman left Jesus after Jesus said, your son's been healed. And he's walking and it must have been at some distance. Because his servants came out to meet him. And they said to the nobleman, your son is healed. He's going to be okay. So when did that happen? Yesterday at about one o'clock, which is when Jesus said it. He didn't even know him. He didn't know him, but he loved him. Because Jesus loves people. John chapter 5, verse 1 to 9. Jesus heals the lame man at the pool of Bethsaida. Now Bethsaida was a, a, a pool of water that... It, once a, day, once a day, an angel would come and stir the water up. And somebody would get in and they'd be healed. They'd be healed. And Jesus saw this poor invalid and he had compassion. And when the angel stirred the water, the guy couldn't, in, couldn't get in fast enough. <laughs> Isn't that horrible? Poor guy's like, oh, splash. No. Yeah. Oop, splash. Every day, day in, day out, he can't get in. He doesn't have anyone to help him in. And Jesus saw him and had compassion on him. He pitied him. So what, and, and, the, and the man told him his story. I'm an invalid. I don't have anybody to get, help me get in the pool. Every time I try, someone gets in before me. And Jesus healed him on the spot. Didn't need the water. Why? Because people. Jesus loves people. John chapter 8, verse 1 to 11. Jesus meets with the woman caught in adultery. He's teaching in the temple. And Jesus is in the temple. And the Pharisees are trying to entrap him. So they bring him this woman caught in adultery. The Bible says that Jesus got down in the dirt and he took his finger and he starts writing in the dirt. He starts writing in the dirt. He does it twice. Now, I don't know, I don't know what he was writing. The doesn't, Bible doesn't say what he was actually, for all I know, he was drawing the first emoticons. I have no idea. It's the first emoji ever written. I don't know. Some say he was writing a list of the sins of the people that were standing there. I don't know. I don't know what he was writing. I'm not sure. What I, what I do know is when he got up, and said, whoever reviews without sin, throw the first rock. Everybody sort of wandered off and wandered away. And Jesus looks at her. What happened to your condemners? Where'd they go? Well, they're, they're not here, and I don't condemn you either. But notice he didn't give her carte blanche to go back to what she was doing. He forgave her. And then he says, now turn away from your sin. Don't live that way anymore. Because Jesus loves people. I feel like this is a missionary rally or something. But that's what the harvest is. That's what this is about. That's what we're about. I don't know the time and place where Jesus is coming. Please, if somebody says he, Jesus is coming, it's got to be here because all the signs point to this and it's going to be October of 2022. If somebody says that they're, they're, they're quacks. The Bible very specifically tells us we don't know the time or the date. We don't know the hour. You know, Jesus is waiting on God. Jesus himself is waiting on God to tell him, now, go now. Isn't that amazing? Because he loves people and he wants as many people <coughs> that would come. He loves people. Listen, it's easy to love kind people. It's easy to love kind people. It's easy to love nice people. 
It's easy to love friends that you choose and people they think like you, they look like you, they act like you. Even family can be hard to love sometimes. You can't choose your family. Look, I love my kids, but when they're on my last nerve, I'd like to have a yard sale, put my kids, make them stand out there, and just pass them off as garden gnomes on sale. And you want two for one, take them both. I love them. You don't pick your family, but it's easier to love, for the most part, your family and, and kind people. But it's not, so, it's not so easy to love somebody that you don't like. It's not easy to love somebody that doesn't like you. It's harder, much harder. They don't think like you. They want to hurt you. They want to mistreat you. They say things and do things that harm you, harm your family, harm the church. And you want to hate them. We want to be angry with them. We, and we said, no, 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 I don't hate them. Listen, all you got to do is say a malicious word. You're hating somebody. You're, you're killing them. Your words will murder somebody. It's a bit harder to love someone that doesn't do things the way that you do or believe your views and certain things. Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 to 45. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Because that's what he taught us to do. That's what he showed us to do. The harvest is precious. It's precious to the Lord. Social media has made it worse. <laughs> Listen, here's the thing. In the 80s, in the 80s, if you didn't like someone, if you didn't like a televangelist or a politician or like a famous musician, there was no way to tell them. You just had to eat it. There was no social media. You can't call the president. You, can't, you could certainly post on a Facebook page now, though. You could certainly post on all kinds of things today. You could drop all kinds of bombs. Say you couldn't stand Lionel Richie, for example. You couldn't be like, hello. Sorry. I don't like you. No, you had to buy a ticket, go to the concert, hope you're in some of the front rows, so you go, I don't like you. And he's not going to hear you anyway. Today, social media has given even Christians license to bomb people from a distance. So we're dropping nuclear bombs on people, hateful comments. You say, Pastor, but it's true. Oh, truth can be damning too. Let me say that again. Truth can be damning and damaging too. Just because it's true doesn't mean it's a good idea for me to share it. Hello? Hello? <laughs> now that song is stuck in my head. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> Don't finish the rest of it. Stop, stop. Social media has made it very easy to drop these hate bombs. And the sad thing about it is the church is doing it to itself. The church is on social media cannibalizing itself. Differing a, of, different of this opinion and that opinion. And, and I get that theology is very important. And we need to know what we believe and where we stand and all of that. But you can either choose to stand on the things that you hold in common if Christ is at the center. No, I'm not talking about, you know, I'm not talking about some cult. But with other churches, other believers in Christ, they may not see everything the way that I do. I may not see the way, everything the way that they do. But we should not be sniping at each other. The church itself is cannibalizing itself on social media. What do you think the rest of the world is saying about that? What are they seeing? If we're going to evangelize our neighbor, our coworker, social media, friends, we've got to stop got to stop hurting people. We've got to think hard before you say what you're going to say. Including our enemies. Because they're precious to Jesus. I'm going to wrap up here. I close with the same verse we started. Because it's important. And we're going to pray. I close with the same verse we started. Matthew chapter 9 verse 35 to 38. The workers are few. We've got you know, precious volunteers in this place. I really mean that. I appreciate it. Uh, Angela, on the she's been running that camera since I've been here. Six years. I mean, she goes home to sleep and stuff, but you know what I mean. Araceli, Jim Austin, others, the whole worship team that shows up, comes in, people that greet, people that help. Drop everything and just, hey, what do you need, Pastor? It's awesome. It's wonderful. Volunteer, and we need that. We need that. We need workers right within the church. 
And as much as we need volunteers and workers within the church, we need workers and volunteers within the kingdom, even more so, to share their faith and be a witness wherever it is they go. I don't go where Dave goes. Wave at me, Dave, so they know who I'm talking about. I love that jacket, by the way. Uh, I don't go where he goes. I don't know who he knows. I, I don't, I, I'm never going to spend time with the friends he does. I can't witness to them. He can. I, I don't know Leslie's family. I, I don't go home with her. I have no idea. I, I, she can witness to them. That goes for everybody in here. You have your own little mission field wherever you're at. And it's important. Matthew 9, 35 to 38. The workers are few. Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. How do you feel about that? Do the people that know you, would they describe you as compassionate? Would they describe you as compassionate? Listen, compassion is somebody still rooting for the eagles <laughs> this year. I'd like to. I'd like to try. <laughs> Compassion is encouraging them because it doesn't. It's not looking good. Not gonna lie. Do we have kindness to people that don't deserve it? Don't think. Don't talk. Don't act. Don't seem like us. Do we have any compassion on them? That's what Jesus did. And he says he had the compassion because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. No, pastor, I don't know anybody like that. Yes, you do. They just haven't said it to you. Reach out. You'll find that the harvest is plentiful all around you. Your own personal harvest. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. I hope this stirs you up. I really do. I get to so much in, in, in so much in the environment right now that has our attention, whether it's COVID or politics or, or this thing or that thing or economy or maybe even in your own home, there, there might be financial stuff or health stuff or whatever. There's so much that's going on. But can we remember once again, once again, can we remember that something that breaks the heart of God ought to break our heart? That what's priority and paramount to Jesus should be priority and paramount to you and I. Let's pray. Will you stand with me? We're just going to stand. And uh, I just want to remind you and encourage you, do, do put your masks on as you leave the building. We want to follow protocol. We want to make certain that everybody feels comfortable. And um, I, I'm probably the biggest proponent of, of forgetting my mask everywhere I go. Matter of fact, oh, no, it's over there, right there. But uh, I want to encourage you. And also, after we're done praying here, I'm going to ask you to be faithful with your giving. Be faithful with your tithe and with your offering. It's why we're able to do what we're able to do. But let's, let's close in prayer. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for your presence, your grace, your mercy this morning. Lord, we do pray for workers, and we ask just what you told us to pray for, that you would equip your church to rise up and do what the church is supposed to do, to share our faith, to reach out into our communities locally, nationally. We ask that you would uh, allow us to do what you've called us to do and give us, give us opportunity to do it. Bring people across our path. Bring the right opportunity. Open doors. Uh, help us to grow in compassion to reach those that can be reached while there's time. We pray for our leaders, both in local government and in federal government. We pray that you would surround them with people that would protect them. We pray that you would let your will be done from the protection of innocent unborn life to the peace in Israel. We pray that you teach us to pray the way you told us to. And we pray for our leaders. We do. We do so with compassion, with kindness. God, I ask that you would arrest us, arrest us on the spot in our spirit if we're sniping at people because they may not see something the way that we do. But help us, help us to reach out in love and in mercy. Lord, Lord, let your will be done. Draw as many king souls into the kingdom as you can, Jesus, before you come back. And you told us to pray, come back. You told us, Jesus, to pray, Maranatha, come back. And we look forward to that day. But we also know that you're not slow in keeping your promise. You just want more souls in the kingdom. Help us. Help us to do that. Help us to do that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. God bless you as you go. Enjoy this beautiful day. If you can help us with offering and tithe and missions in the back.